Today, I'll show you how to code a third-person camera, from scratch, in 3.js. By the end of this tutorial, you'll understand how third-person cameras work, you'll understand how to design the architecture for a game, and you'll understand how to code this all up. In short, you'll be able to build this, and we'll walk through every step of the way, explaining everything as we go. So let's start by quickly going over what we mean by a third-person camera, like, what is that? There are a few commonly used cameras used by games, and they tend to fall into two categories. You've got first-person cameras, which is kind of like a point-of-view camera where you see through the eyes of the protagonist. There's like a jillion examples of this. Doom and other shooters always come to mind. Then there's third-person cameras, and you see it a lot in games too, where the camera is kind of creeping along behind the player, keeping both them and the environment in view at the same time. It's like a bird's eye view, or you could imagine if a drone was following you and recording everything you do, which, while also super creepy, would be exactly what a third-person camera is in a game. And I can probably think of a million games that use this vantage point, like here we've got Horizon Zero Dawn, and you can see that the camera kind of floats behind the character, often slightly offset to the character's right, as if it's looking over their shoulder. Other games might use a more centered one, Mario comes to mind, See how the camera follows with everything much more centered? But the gist of it is they follow the player, looking roughly in the same direction. So there's a few parts that make up the behavior of the camera then. Say we have a player standing here, and I'll just draw some crappy little guy standing on the ground, and now we'll represent the camera with this eye thing up here. Your first intuition might be to really just take the camera, point it at the player, offset it by a specific XY coordinate, so now when the player moves, the camera trails along looking at them. But look back to some of the videos of other games. The camera isn't looking directly at them, it's actually looking in the same direction as they are. It's looking ahead of them. So back here in our sketch, the camera isn't looking directly at the player, what it should be doing is looking ahead, wherever the player is looking, like this. We've picked a spot ahead of the player, and the camera is kind of looking in that direction instead. The other thing that the camera needs to do is follow the player. Look at this footage of that new Wukong game, and watch how the camera swings around as the player moves. Notice that the camera isn't necessarily fixed completely to the player, like it's a GoPro on a helmet, but many games add a little bit of dampening in there, like the camera is fixed to a spring that is attached to the player. That way the camera moves much more smoothly, more naturally. Okay, so let's start thinking about code. The first thing we want to do is take a step back and try to think about the design, so that whatever we end up with is future-proof and doesn't come back to bite us down the road. How I would do this is to decouple input, character movement, and camera logic into separate, isolated components, and although for this crappy little demo it won't matter in the slightest, down the road you can do things like make an AI character by simply reusing the character movement behavior, but make it puppeted by an AI instead, which is neat because you're getting a bunch of reuse here. So, all great code starts with copy-pasting from somewhere, so like always, we're just going to reuse some existing code to get started. I'll start by creating this 3.js tutorial third-person camera directory, and then I'm just going to copy the character controller code in there to get going. If you haven't seen that video, definitely go check it out. Let's start by creating a new class, Third Person Camera, and this will contain all of the logic for keeping the camera fixed to the player, following them around, and doing it smoothly. We'll assume that the actual camera we're manipulating gets passed in via the params, so we can just go like this dot underscore camera equals params dot camera. Down in the main setup code, we'll actually instantiate the real 3GS camera, so we'll just set up a perspective camera here. We just need to set up all the parameters, so we're not going to do anything special here. Fav is 60, aspect ratio is just width over height, near and far are 1 and 1000 respectively, and we instantiated a perspective camera with those parameters. Right underneath this is where we'll instantiate the new third person camera, and the first parameter it needs is the 3JS camera, so we'll call new third person camera, and in the params we'll set the 3JS camera. We'll also need to update this new camera each frame, so down in the step function we'll add this line, this dot underscore third person camera dot update, with the time elapsed as the parameter. What this will do is give us an entry point each frame to do any bookkeeping and update necessary for the camera. So if the player moves, for example, this update function will see the character move and smoothly move to follow. 
Let's fill in the third person camera class now. And what you may be surprised to see is that this will be a really short class. First thing is the constructor will have two member properties, this.currentPosition and this.currentLookAt. And these will be responsible for tracking the current position of the camera and the current position the camera is looking. The next thing we want to do is go down here and add an update function. If you recall in the main step function, we specifically called the camera's update function, and that was to give the camera some time to do any internal logic needed. Now we have to actually implement this, so the first thing we want to do is add those two values that we need to compute. I'll just add a quick comment here saying that we'll have to come back and actually fill these in, but we've declared ideal offset and ideal look at. We're going to go ahead and use them right away. And so down here, I'll take the 3JS camera that was passed in as a parameter, and I'll set the position directly to ideal offset. And you can use position.copy to do that. Now we need to orient the camera to look at the ideal look at position, and that's a simple call to camera.lookat and pass ideal look at as the parameter. Now let's go back and actually fill in values for ideal offset and ideal look at. We'll add a function, calculate ideal offset, and that will be used to compute the ideal position of the camera given the current position of the character. And I'll define the function itself, and it'll just involve a little bit of vector math. We'll start with an offset, so I'll just do this by hand for now, and we'll hard code a value. I'll just make the camera a bit behind the character and a little bit over their shoulder. The next thing you do is copy the character's orientation since the offset is in local space. So that's what this line apply quaternion with the target's rotation as a parameter does. Finally, we just add the character's position and that should give us the final value so we just return it. We also need to do nearly the exact same thing for ideal look at. So let's just call that. So ideal look at equals this dot calculate ideal look at. And then we'll go up here and we need to define a function called calculate ideal look at. Now, the body of the function will be nearly identical to calculate ideal offset, in that we start with some sort of offset. In this case, I'm going to hard code an offset ahead of the character in local space. Then we call apply quaternion with the character's rotation, which is exactly what we did previously, and that will just orient the target position in the right direction. Finally, we add the character's position and return the value. You may notice that these two functions are nearly identical, and in fact, as a nice refactoring step, I'll probably go back and collapse these into a single function. Anyway, in the update function, we've just used these two values directly in the camera and look at functions, so let's load this up and see how it feels. Here's the character, and we can walk around and notice how the camera is trailing, and it's working pretty well considering how little work this was. But notice as I turn around, swing around, move, the camera always follows super exactly. There's no natural motion to it. We need to make some small modifications in the code to get the natural springy feel. Back in the update function, there's a few approaches we can take. I'll show you a super simple way that isn't quite right, and then we'll explore some better ones after that. So the absolute simplest thing you can do, is something you often see is something like this. We'll take the current position and call lerp on the ideal position. So this dot current position dot lerp into the ideal position. And what this means is that every frame given two positions will interpolate a percentage of the way between them. So let's say we've got this start and end point. And after one frame, we interpolate a percentage of the way there. So we're about here now. Then the next frame, we do the same thing. Given the new starting point and the end, we interpolate the same percentage of the way, and so on. What ends up happening is the point smoothly slows down as it reaches the goal. So let's see this in action. When we load this up, notice how the camera has a little bit of a slow start stop, kind of like it's accelerating, decelerating. And if we were to spin around, we get a cool effect where the camera has this nice natural feel to it. You can, of course, play with the coefficient. Increasing it means the camera moves much more exactly with less of a spring, but still some. I'll drop back down into the code for a second, and let's change the value from 0 0.05 to 0 0.15. Now when we load that up, the camera is much crisper, while still retaining just a bit of spring. So honestly, you could stop here. This works pretty well, and a lot of people do. But there's a problem, and it's that your camera movement isn't frame rate independent. We're lerping by a constant amount every frame. Your first thought might be to factor in the frame time to the lerp coefficient, and that does work, although it's not quite right. Let's try it out. We can change the coefficient by multiplying by the frame time. So in the code, all we need to do is, I'll comment out the old one and add a new coefficient. Constant t equals 4.0 times time elapsed. 
I just chose this because at 30 FPS, this is roughly equal to 0.12, give or take, so somewhat similar to what we were working with before. Loading that up, you're not going to see that much different. It looks roughly the same, but in theory, if the frame rate dips, or if you run this on another machine with a massively higher frame rate, the camera should act mostly the same. Mostly. But not quite. And that's because it's not fully frame rate independent. To get this to be fully frame rate independent, we're going to need to modify the coefficient again to something that's not at all intuitive, but works. Here, we'll comment out the old one, and then we'll declare this new one. This will be t equals 1.0 minus math.pow 0.001 to the power time elapsed. This isn't going to be massively different from the previous version, just slightly more correct. And to prove it's more correct, we'll actually run some numbers to prove the differences. Here's a block of testing code that we're going to use, and this will simulate the effects of running at two different frame rates, one at 100 FPS and one at 50 FPS. And all the code is doing is running in a loop, doing lerps over and over again, starting at a start value and moving towards the end value. And so when we use the constant value, in this case we use the constant of 0.01 to illustrate the difference, when we write out the final values, what we end up with is something like 63 versus 39. See how at 100 FPS versus 50 FPS, we ended up with a big difference, and that's only over the course of a single second. The slightly corrected version that factors in the frame rate does better, but still isn't right. So in this case, what I got was 63.39 versus 63.58. Notice how close this got, but they're not quite the same. There are actually some small differences over time that would accumulate if you were running this over like 5-10 seconds. So we'll use the last equation. I'm going to use 1.0 minus math.pow 0.3 to the time elapsed. And these are damn near identical, down to some small floating point differences that are in the like the 17th digit. As good as we're going to get today. And here we can compare visually. So here's the first version. I'll just artificially screw with the frame rate. So on the left we have full frame rate. On the right I've introduced a bottleneck on the main thread just to force the frame rate down. Notice how on the right, how as I spin, you can see the camera lags pretty noticeably. Normally I can't see much of the character's face, but at least with these settings and the artificially slow version, he's able to spin around a lot more while the camera struggles to catch up. Let's look at the final version now. So on the left is full frame rate, on the right we've got our artificially slowed down version. There's not a world of difference here anymore. It mostly looks the same, give or take. And that's where we're going to stop this tutorial, because we've covered enough to give you the basic mechanics of a third-person camera. Obviously, there's a lot more complexity to explore, but this should get you going at least. Like and subscribe, check out the code on GitHub, and if you've got things that you want to see covered in the future, let me know. Until next time, cheers.